Foster. I'm the executive director here at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, we're very thrilled to welcome you to this conversation this evening. I think we'll find very um, enlightening and interesting. Um, and uh, it's being done in conjunction with this exhibition that you're sitting amongst right now, uh, The Matter Within Contemporary Art of India, curated by our director of visual arts, uh, Betty Sue Hertz, who will speak, be speaking to this evening as well. Um, it's just great to see so many people here, and I know we have a great evening ahead. I want to introduce Jack Wadsworth to speak for a minute, who is uh, with uh, Jay Ju of the Asian Art Museum, and Stephen Beal of CCA is one of the co-founders of the Asian Contemporary Arts Consortium of San Francisco, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, Betty Sue will come up and uh, introduce Melissa, and we'll get started. So once again, thanks so much for coming tonight, and Jack. Ken, thank, thank you very much. Um, and representing, uh, we call it ACK, ACK, SF. Um, we're delighted to be in partnership here with the Yerba Buena Center and the Asian Art Museum, uh, organizing and sponsoring particularly this, these conversations. Of course, the exhibition is terrific, and there have been uh, conversations going on for the last couple of days at the Asian Art Museum, so this is kind of the uh, capstone, I, I would like to hope, of those conversations. Um, I would like to spend two minutes, no more, just telling you what is ACAC SF because it's new in San Francisco. Um, it really uh, is uh, an organization that has been formed to raise the profile of contemporary Asian art in the Bay Area. To be very specific, we are dedicated to raising awareness and understanding, to building audiences, and promoting and sustaining interest in Asian contemporary arts and design in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this has been in business for a little bit over a year. Uh, a lot has been accomplished. Um, and it takes its uh, really idea from something called ACAC in New York, which started off uh, at the Asia Society in New York uh, with the leadership of Melissa Chu and, and Vishaka Desai, who you'll be hearing from tonight. And we like to think back on uh, that moment as a moment when group of like-minded people came together in New York and really successfully over 10 years, I think, to put the Asian contemporary art field uh, in, a different, uh, in, in a different place in New York. Um, and uh, I think we can all see that in, in every facet of, of the contemporary Asian art scene uh, in New York. And let me just say a couple of things we've accomplished in the last year. Uh, we have pulled together an advisory board, uh, a group of members. Uh, we're so far members 28. Uh, it is really the leadership, I think, of this field uh, in San Francisco. And uh, our core members, as Ken mentioned, are Jay Shu and Stephen Beal and myself, Bruce Pickering, who heads the Asia Society here, Cheryl Haynes of the Haynes Gallery, Wendy Norris of the Frey Norris Gallery, uh, Doug Akaki uh, from the design community, and Chung Moon Lee and myself. Um, in this short period of time, uh, we have created a logo, a website, um, our home is at CCA, uh, who is providing office space and infrastructure. Uh, we have sponsored a number of conversations already this year. We've started a writing fellowship um, in critical thinking and writing in the Asian contemporary art field. Um, the winner uh, will have an honorarium and will be named an, an ACAC fellow. Uh, the jury for this uh, uh, award is Britta Erickson, uh, Wuhan Ru, Glenn Helfand, uh, Sanji Kavini Bauer, and Patricia Maloney. Um, we have an ambitious program uh, for the next year, um, and the person who will lead that, uh, who I would like to introduce to you, is Xiaoyu Wong. And let me just say, Xiaoyu uh, uh, has taken this project by storm. She has a BA in Art History from the Central Academy in Beijing. Uh, she has an MA in Curatorial Practice from CCA. She's already curated about 15 exhibitions as an independent curator, and obviously has led uh, ACAC SF uh, into a very robust start. Uh, so please welcome and a round of applause for Xiaoyu. Stand up, please. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for supporting. 
supporting such an important program. It's nice to see all of you here, and I welcome you to our home here at the uh, Year of Women's Center for the Arts. And I think we have a fantastic program tonight, and I'm very, very pleased that all of us are here to um, think about these uh, important issues together. So the first panel um, is going to be moderated by Melissa Chu. Melissa is the Museum Director and Vice President of the Global Heart Programs at the Asia uh, Society in New York. Uh, she's a leading authority on Asian contemporary art and has organized nearly 30 exhibitions of artists from across Asia, including a retrospective of uh, Jean Wong. Her um, most recent book, of several books, uh, has a few books there that she's written, um, is Contemporary Art in Asia, a Critical Reader, published by MIT Press, which she co-edited with Benjamin Jim Chiu. And she currently serves on the board of the Association of Art Museum Curators, the American Association of Museums, and the Museums Association of New York. She's a very special person and wonderful colleague, and we're very, very pleased that she's with us tonight to lead our panel. So if you want to come up and listen and all of the other panelists for this first panel. Of 
course, today's panel and some of the questions that have been posed to um, tonight's speakers uh, revolve around cultural specificity and globalization. These are, in, in fact, two, two of the real vexing issues that curators and writers have to deal with in this field, especially here in the United States, because we, we, uh, we at times, uh, on the one hand, we want to bring Asia and kind of educate and familiarize people with Asia in particular. And yet sometimes we don't feel uh, like the knowledge, uh, the kind of foundational knowledge, is necessarily there, um, not only in the academy, but also just even in high school. But let's indeed cast our minds back to where we find ourselves today. We think of recent times of especially the establishment of the market. In fact, there's a little bit of a market obsession around Asian contemporary art today. Um, often when I give talks, people often say, you know, who is the hot young artist I should be looking at? You know, who should I be collecting? You know, there's, there's this kind of interest but if we think back to, um, to an appreciation of, of where it all started, we have to remember that actually Asian contemporary art, when we talk about it as, a, as, as an experimental art discipline, really is a post-war phenomenon. I mean, if we think back to the 1950s and 1960s of great experimental art being created, especially in East Asia, in Japan and Korea, we must always think that Asian contemporary art is not just grounded in the marketplace. Of course, it was during the 1990s that Asian contemporary art kind of reached museums. It was in the early 1990s, in fact, that Asia Society convened one of the very first discussions, conversations on Asian contemporary art under the leadership of Vishaka Desai. We also had, in 1993, the first Asia Pacific Triennial in the region that was in Brisbane, in Australia, which was one of the very first uh, convenings of many of the artists within Asia and became a real meeting place and um, time in which Asian contemporary art really came to the fore in terms of museum appreciation. There were also the Asian art shows in Fukuoka in Japan. And the Japan Foundation did a lot of scholarly work bringing together the artist run initiatives that were really the laboratories for uh, and showing places for many artists in Asia. Then throughout the 1990s, many European ex uh, exhibition or many exhibitions started to happen in Europe. If we think of the very first Chinese contemporary art exhibition, which was in 1993 in Hong Kong and then in Berlin and Sydney, that was really the first wave of Chinese contemporary then if I think to my own uh, coming to the United States in 2001, where I was the first, curator I, I got the first curatorial position with a focus on Asian contemporary art, and that was only 10 years ago here in the United States. Then I think if we want to talk about the market, it really was in 2005 that the market was established with the very first successful sales in 2005 in Hong Kong of Chinese contemporary art that broke many records. So if we think of those, uh, those kind of dates as markers for our understanding of Asian contemporary art, we also have to think about the scholarship around it because I think many of us have felt for a long time that this is the piece that has been missing. There have been many shows. But really, how do, how do we study this topic? How do we discuss this topic? What are the theoretical parameters? When I began to teach this subject a number of years ago, there were, in fact, very few source books here in the United States. It was very difficult. We had to piece together our own library, magazines, articles that had been published. So I think that there has been much work now done um, to try to contribute to um, allowing students to really study in depth this so today, yes, certainly things have changed. And most museums, in fact, from our conversations at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum, have really uh, indicated to me, at least, that there's been a landmark shift in terms of the way that certainly museum directors are thinking about Asian contemporary art. 
So we have many of them integrated with Asian and contemporary art, both into their contemporary art sections and also their Asian sections. So for me, the, uh, the top three questions that I think we'll try to get at tonight uh, before I turn over to the colleagues. You know, what are the questions actually at stake in the field of Asian contemporary art today? What are the most challenging obstacles that we must indeed overcome? And where is the field headed? So we have some big topics to deal with, but um, let me first, if I may, turn over to Joan, who is right there over in the far corner. Joan's done a lot of work in terms of um, publishing in this area, especially in academic forums um, with a great book by Duke University Press, um, which was an academic journal for positions which focus specifically on Asian contemporary art, which was one of the first of its kind. So, John, if, if I might ask you to lead the way. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. Also, thank you, uh, Betty Sue, for inviting me uh, here. I think really the first, the first problem, in a way, has been kind of addressed. One is that the fact that contemporary Asian art has actually exists as a bona fide discipline. Uh, just to give you kind of uh, anecdotal evidence, in 1996, I applied for an internship at an extremely well-known New York museum. They took one look at my CV, and they, or resume rather, and they said, why don't you do real Asian art? Uh, ten, almost 10 years later, the Chinese artist Chai Bo Chan was on the roof. So that gives you some indication about the extent to which the field actually has changed and has been accepted within sort of a larger understanding of contemporary art. What I found interesting just going through this particular show, and this is a really a segue to get into some of the other issues that, uh, uh, that will be elaborated later, is uh, the, this interesting counterpart between the, sh the smaller show upstairs by Alan D'Souza, who is an artist of South Asian descent. He lives and works here in San Francisco. And of course, the show that we see here on display of contemporary South Asian art. And there's an interesting, say, divide or transition. So Alan D'Souza is really an artist who has come of professional age in the 1990s when you start hearing words like global and local. And by that, it really, in the 1990s, that really means, say, an attempt to make sense of these very sweeping changes that are taking place all over the world. And versus, say, wanting to make sense of that on a very personal level. So the words that you'll see upstairs with Alan D'Souza, they're very small, they're intimate, even though they're of very, very large landscapes. So he's taking pictures right outside an airplane. So he's seeing these very vast landscapes, but he's scaling them down. He's making, he's really focusing on the texture, making it feel as personal, as intimate as possible. Now, you go down the stairs and you see this, this large show, The Matter Within. And one of the things that's very striking about the show is the incredible attention to technique, to form. It's very sophisticated. Uh, these artists are clearly referencing, not only referencing, but they have a vast store of knowledge about the way contemporary art is made and circulated today. They're reading the same magazines and books as their counterparts all over the world. And so what you get instead, instead of, say, global versus local, is that the local has already been sort of subsumed into the global. That, say, referring to certain contextual factors is already part of globalization. But what you see with these particular works in their incredible attention to detail, to scale, to color, to size, to composition, is a different kind of divide that separates, say, form versus context. And this attention to form, it's not, as Melissa points out, it's not just about the market. It's really about trying to really push back against, say, older worldviews that would have situated these artists primarily as Indian artists. They would have situated these artists primarily in terms of their nationality, their cultural background, their ethnicity. This is something that these artists clearly don't want. It's something that they share with their counterparts all over the world. So one of the questions I'm interested in is, well, what do we make of such a world that's divided between these two pools of form versus context? And if that worldview is to hold, is there a way in which we can think about it differently so that it doesn't seem like these artists just look like their counterparts everywhere else? So in other words, is there, is there a way where we can think of these artworks without looking at them as, say, anthropological evidence or 
as, say, homogeneous works that could be found in any gallery in, say, any major metro metropo metro metropolis of the world. Thank you, John. I think you, uh, in your first anecdote, did actually get at one of the issues that many of us have struggled with, which is initially the initially the real issue was about acceptance, finding acceptance, especially in general or encyclopedic museums for Asian contemporary art. And then it actually became a bit of a struggle between where to actually put Asian contemporary art. Did it go in the uh, largely uh, international but mostly Western contemporary art department, or was it based in the traditionally Asian uh, department. And I think that many institutions have now kind of come around to not necessarily one or the other, but sometimes collaborations between both departments, which I think is a, um, a good approach. Carol, uh, just in the interest of uh, going uh, now to my right, I wanted to turn it over to you and uh, see what, uh, what you would like to contribute to the conversation. <coughs> Thank you, Alisa, for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Or is yes, it... yes, this is good actually. I'm very excited to talk to you today um, in the panel from a very distance and my very local basis of Beijing. Yeah, I believe I'm digitally connected to you as well as conceptually, hopefully. So I, I, was, um, I would be very interested in responding to one of the questions that was um, sent to me previously in the email, which um, was um, asking us to propose interesting studies for grounding global and trans-Asian practices and issues. I have two examples to put forward. The first one is a six-year research workshop on the Anani project, an exhibition project, headed by Hans Gauti and Peter Weber at ZKF which has led to the organization of an exhibition titled Global Contemporary Art World of 1989. The most interesting part of this exhibition for me is the eight rooms of histories, histories in Cuba, a section that consisted of many documentations. Here I quote Hans Bauting's statement for the section, Visualize the chronology and the geographic dissemination of global art production. Resulting genealogy cannot be integrated in any other model of street art history. Other forms of narration are required that also cover the geopolitical situation of art in all its facets. A plurality of narratives or histories is characteristic of the current discourse. Does the representability of today's art actually reveals itself as the represent representability of various art worlds, biennales, museums, markets, which are as much the focus as the art itself? So, in this documentation part of the exhibition, um, Bauti presented documentations in eight sections. Each section documented a certain um, movement, a certain phenomenon that has marked contemporary art in the past two decades. Um, one of the sections was very much on the history of the rise of the analysis all over the world that you were uh, citing earlier. And another section was a strong focus on also the rise of the art market as an important, uh, in Asia, as an important facet of how we understand the discourse on global art today. So for me, the most important outcome of his research and discussion, much more so than the actual exhibition itself, is in that it reviewed its profound view of global art today through articulations of our interconnectedness. The, the room of history, the eight rooms of history in the show map up moments and points of our connections. What links us today is more than a singular historic reality that we all need to find anchors to or inspire ourselves to, but the coexistences of two world centers 
dynamics of movements. I think the global connections have enabled us to learn about our differences and to discover potential connections and synergy among our differences. So it's not to eliminate or to avoid discussions of differences, but to see how we can develop synergies through our differences. And the second example I would like to share is a recent exhibition that I have co-curated with artists and curator Judy. This exhibition is entitled Little Movements, Self-Practice in Contemporary Art. In this exhibition, that has opened uh, in OCAT, an art center in Shenzhen, South China, in September. We have brought together different models of art history writing, publishing, artist collective, art education and knowledge production practices, as well as in institutional together from the 80s, 90s, and since 2000. These practices happened in Europe, in America, and in China, but we deliberately presented all 17 practices in a non-linear order and mixed the practices from different geographies and regions together. Here we want to propose our views to uh, both the art system and the art history, treating both as a non-hierarchical and non-linear structure. This is what we wrote at the beginning of the exhibition, beginning of the quote. We believe that every sector of the art industry would be an equal creative subject. And rather than being a hierarchy, the art system consists of modes of creativity and individual methodologies that exist simultaneously and equally. We also tend to view art history not as a threat that runs through time, but a flat surface where movements and challenges at different points of time and geography happen in parallels rather than progressively and logic of evolution. Are you finished now? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I think um, clearly, you know, what's, what I think is useful about this panel is also we have Carol's contribution clearly uh, coming from the perspective of a curator living and working in Asia and her two projects that she outlined for uh, ZKM and also her project with Lu Ding um, do identify some of the issues around time and place that I think really get at the heart of some of the questions around Asian contemporary. Now I'd like to turn to Betty Sue Hertz for another kind of curatorial approach. Betty has, uh, has done a number of uh, large-scale Asian contemporary art shows here on the West Coast over the past decade, and so we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm actually going to shift us to um, the local art scene and a little, hopefully give a little sort of snapshot of kind of micro history that um, was part of my own biography that I think points to some, um, extending some of the issues that my colleagues have already um, discussed. And, excuse me, because I'm going to read from, from this. And um, I'm also going to go backwards a little bit because I think it helps us frame um, some of the issues that we're dealing with now. Um, so firstly, I want to say that I think that the paradigm of the local and global is no longer useful, or maybe better said, it is no longer relevant as a construct that we can successfully frame the actions of curators and artists. For me, it is now a historical trope that was useful in the 1980s and early 1990s, and I think it will soon take up a position something like the feminist slogan, the personal is political. In other words, I think that we are moving past this kind of binary, which is constricting and problematic, especially when considering contemporary art from Asia. My first experience working with Asian artists was in a multicultural moment in New York City in the mid-1980s, um, where I worked with both Asian American artists and Asian artists who were negotiating a shared space. And I'm <coughs> out by one where restricted access to museums and important galleries 
was still very much in play, as Melissa was mentioning earlier. Um, the Godzilla Asian American Arts Network sprung up from this local artistic environment. This was an arts collective and supportive network active from 1990 until 2001. The founding members believed that Asian American artists did not have a suitable organization to support, promote, and encourage their visual arts, and Godzilla sought to fill this need. Founded by artist Ken Chu, it included Paul Pfeiffer, Lin Yamamoto, Young Soon Min, um, Tamiya Harai, and many, many others. Importantly, this group of artists was pan-Asian American, so the dialogue was centered on being America, Asian in America, rather than on a specific culture within Asia. The meetings were open, and I sometimes attended, and even wrote for the publication. In other words, it extended beyond the Asian American art, artists themselves. At the same time, many artists from Asia were coming to, into New York. Some came to study, and others to be at the center of the art scene, and benefit from the cosmopolitan, culturally diverse, and relatively open spirit of New York City. In particular, there was a vibrant community of Japanese artists who arrived to New York's Lower East Side, where I was living at the time, in the 1980s, and became integrated into the vibrant sort of art scene in general that was a very, very important moment in um, New York art history. In the mid-80s, I organized the Asian Art Show at a small nonprofit gallery in the South Bronx. It was my first foray into curating contemporary Asian art which brought together these two communities, unintentionally collapsing the category of Asian American and Asian, and therefore emphasizing commonalities across all kinds of difference, which is something that Carol mentioned in a completely different context. Within my world, the artists who had migrated from other countries to be in New York was changing the local art world culture, and I was deep, in the, in, deep into the local culture um, at that point. It was also a moment when being at the edge was being deeply questioned. In other words, not being included in gallery shows, not being included in museum shows, or being discussed, um, as we've been talking about in other contexts. Most importantly, the relationships formed at this micro level, level would prove to be significant later, especially when many artists who had come from Asia returned home. And I think that this is an important mo uh, moment of uh, migration and sort of, sort of temporary migration. It was only because of the system of temporary migration that I was able to put together an exhibition at the San Diego Museum of Art in 2004 titled Past and Reverse, Contemporary Art of East Asia, because friends and colleagues had now resettled back to cities such as Hong Kong, Taipei, Seoul, and Tokyo. They generously put me in touch with the local art scenes in their city, as I had done for them when they were in New York, so it's a reciprocal relationship. By the early 2000s, a monumental shift was taking place in the Asian art scene, with more efforts to create infrastructures of museums, alternative spaces, and markets inside Asia. Artists returned home to participate in the local, in the development of local art scenes. Yet I firmly believe that permanent and temporary migrations are at the root of true global networks, which are now represented not by a unidirectional movement, but by multi-dimensional movements within Asia and across the diaspora. It's hard to believe that up until a few years ago, many Japanese artists had had no contact with the Korean art scene, but had only been looking to the West and going to London and New York. It is obvious all around us that this is no longer the obvious trajectory of exchange, that Asian arts communities are shaping and nurturing the discourses, circuits, and display of art within the region. This is clearly the direction of a meeting I attended in Hong Kong about 10 years ago of alternative exhibition state spaces stretching from Malaysia to India, motivated by a desire to create an Asian network of artistic exchange. Some museums, such as the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, and organizations like the Asian Art Archive, which is now celebrating its 10th year, that are shifting and recording the pattern or patterns of the earlier decades. Magazines like Asia Art Pacific have been a catalyst for representing 
newer identities for a pan-Asian sphere. Yet for me, it is still the artists with their nomadic residences and exhibitions in many cities throughout the world that are giving form to how Asia is now participating as a sure-footed partner in the global arts. Thank you, Betty Sue. I think that you've raised um, one issue that we often don't talk about in terms of Asian contemporary art, which is the Asian American equation to things. And certainly issues around diaspora have be become increasingly important to an understanding of what's going on in Asia, especially now as it really is a different period when artists really do often go back and forth between two, different, two or three multiple different homes. If we think of Rupert uh, Tiruvanit, and he, he identifies three homes, in fact, <laughs> um, as, as his base, Chiang Mai, Berlin, and New York, and he's just one example. But I do think that things are much more complex in terms of uh, home and away kind of relationships. So our final speaker is Apsara. Who will, of course, contribute to the discussion, and then I'll open it up um, to the speakers to address in more greater detail some of the questions that have been raised. And then, of course, we'll open it up to you for Q and A. Thank you. Um, so I recently had this incredible opportunity to go to um, Vietnam um, and doing research for an upcoming exhibition that I'm uh, working on for September of 2012, and. Um, I was able to visit with this extraordinary group of artists who have created this uh, nonprofit organization called Sen Art, and um, they'll be featured in this exhibition that I'm working on. Uh, and Sen Art is an, an, art, an artist-initiated gallery space and reading room that um, was opened in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam in October of 2007. And San art, San, the word San means um, platform in, in Vietnamese, and I think that's really important to consider as well. Um, and um, they, um, there's about four artists who created this, this space. One, their names are Ding Kyu Lei, Tuan Andrew Nguyen, Phu Nam, and Tiffany Chung. And they um, established uh, the platform space um, because outside of commercial enterprises there was really no um, contemporary art spaces for artists to come together and show their work um, and um, host residencies and panel discussions within Ho Chi Minh City. So they're doing incredibly important cultural work um, and really helping to, to um, create a new model within that city um, and to create an infrastructure um, where there really hasn't been one for them. Um, and um, in order to understand the incredible situation they're working under, I thought, um, given that this is a panel on cultural specificity, it would also be important to understand uh, a few facts about um, Vietnam. Um, the cultural ministry of, of the Vietnamese communist government must approve cultural public events and publications of associated textual material, um, which includes visual art related activities such as, and related activities such as exhibitions. Um, and this has resulted in a very heavily censored environment for those artists um, and, and all of the organizations um, must abide by that if they want to remain open. Um, the art education system in Vietnam is modeled on uh, the French Ecole um, de Beaux-Arts system, which was established in Hanoi in 1924. Um, and, and that, of course, focuses on um, more traditional application of plastic arts. Um, the uh, university there has very little um, books or visual materials um, for artists to use um, post-1975, and this has resulted in um, the creation of many different reading rooms that are largely private within Ho Chi Minh City and Sa 
Sun Art actually started as a reading room itself. Um, and a more recent version and uh, a much larger version actually is um, a, a space called Dia Projects, which was opened by Rich Streitmeier Tran, who's also an artist living and working there. Um, one important to think, thing to consider about all of these artists who open this space is that they are actually um, referred to as Viet Q artists, um, which is actually a derogatory name that's applied to overseas Vietnamese artists. So Vietnamese artists who, uh, whose families fled during the war were refugees, and then those artists were raised and educated in um, the West primarily and then um, came back to Vietnam and are now living and working in Ho Chi Minh City. So uh, that's, they've had to really struggle in order to reconnect with um, their local audiences and artists um, because they've had to overcome a certain amount of biases. Um, um, there is no such thing as a nonprofit, as a legal entity in Vietnam. Um, so uh, this, makes it very challenging for them to receive funding. So much of the funding actually comes uh, from abroad and um, through a um, non-profit foundation that is actually based in Los Angeles, um, which uh, Dean Kuehle's gallery helped him start. So it's, it's a complicated um, system that they have to navigate. Um, and there is no public cultural institution in Vietnam that collects contemporary Vietnamese art. So those are a few of the challenges that they are facing in creating um, this new platform. Thank you, Absar. I think that gives us a great glimpse into just one kind of localized art scene in Asia, in, with particular attention to Ho Chi Minh City. And I mentioned before the role of artist-run initiatives or artist-run spaces, and I think that certainly in the past 30 years, they have provided the support for artists to enable them to produce work, show work, um, have a community in the absence of any kind of museum, uh, you know, museum, museums of contemporary art uh, absent from most countries in in Asia, and certainly in Vietnam, this doesn't exist. So I think that gives you a, a nice kind of inroad into um, some of the challenges, certainly for artists working within the region. So if we could turn now to uh, uh, to some of the questions that I raised, and it's clear that the understanding of contemporary art in Asia has come a long way in the last 20 years. But I wonder, now we're, we're in a situation where the market has been established, Museums are collecting Asian contemporary art. Curators are interested in this topic, both in Asia and here in the United States and Europe. So um, in terms of our reading of when we need to go next as a field, you know, we're, we've come to well on a decade of major exhibitions being presented here in the United States of Indian contemporary art, as we see, Chinese contemporary art, Vietnam, all of these places. So where do you think we need to go next? And I might pose this question first to John. I think the most sort of basic question is that there really isn't a whole lot of empirical information about whole parts of not only Asia, but time periods. Uh, most of the information that we have tends to be, tends to center around, say, a workspace roughly from, say, 1980 to the present. Only in recent years have you had have you had studies on, say, the Gutai movement in Japan, which was a movement that has been likened to abstract expressionism, but really actually claims its own kind of singularity? Uh, that has only really happened within, say, roughly the past 10 years or so. And there, there are whole parts that we just don't know much about. Say, for example, Cambodia or, say, Laos. Uh, another issue is, say, translation. Uh, there's information that's being published, but it really doesn't get translated into, say, languages that are more accessible to a broader audience, English or French or what have you. Uh, so the need for translators is certainly pressing. And the third issue that really also is, really has to kind of be addressed is 
When you're dealing with a particular area where you don't have a lot of translation and you don't have, say, a critical mass of curators or art, sort of art historians or critics, it usually tends to be the case that maybe a very select handful of people serve as the gatekeepers for, quote unquote, a larger international audience. So that in certain places, everything you know about that, the, the history of that place is being filtered by one or two people. And so that causes huge rifts and say imbalances of power. So how are we going to address that? How are we going to make it that the view that we're getting in terms of history and in both in, and the contemporary art scene is going to be much more balanced. Uh, I don't want to say the word objective because nothing is objective in art history, but uh, at least a more sort of broader view than what's currently available. Yeah, I think it's a good point about this uh, idea of gatekeepers because I think often it's just um, what's expedient, you know, in a sense that often the people who are called upon constantly within certain countries are simply those that speak English that it's actually about a language issue more than a skills base or anything like that. So I think that broadening out our, uh, the people who we come into contact with, I often give advice to people visiting countries for the first time, I say, never meet just one person and have them take you around. It's like, if you want to get a full picture, you really need to meet multiple people to be able to help you with some terms of I wonder, Carol, since you're on Skype, I want to keep you in the conversation here. I know that the time is probably not, um, we're, what, 12 hours difference, not so bad. But um, I wonder if you might talk to us a bit about what it's like being a curator in Beijing, in China. What are the particular challenges that face you? Uh, many times when I give talks on Chinese contemporary art, everyone wants to know about censorship. Um, and certainly the recent events in Beijing around Ai Weiwei Studio has called this into greater atten international attention. So what's it really like working as a curator? Unfortunately, there has been a lot of echo about, uh, around the other panels, uh, panelists' speeches, so I might not be following your conversation very well. But uh, what I want to uh, contribute to the discussion is actually a recent kind of, um, not so much as a phenomenon, but a certain sensation that a lot of practitioners in China share, which is a kind of anxiety of self-definition. And this very much comes from um, many, a few years of accumulation of this market boom and this um, kind of hype around Chinese contemporary art. In 2008, there was a conference organized in London where a group of uh, British scholars and museum curators um, uh, set out for a conversation with a group of artists and curators and art critics from China. And one of the challenges and questions that was posed to the practitioners from China was that um, Many people from China have complained that all these major survey exhibitions that have been done about Chinese contemporary art were curated from a Western perspective, from a pers an external perspective. Um, then, what's your internal view? Uh, what's, what, has, what kind of discourse have you developed around art practitions and art practice and art productions in China? What kind of methodology have you conceived to describe and to articulate the kind of thinking and practices going on in China? And this is very much the kind of question that the, that many people working in China are, are puzzled about. They cannot answer this question. It's really that we haven't fully developed a discourse or a many responses around our, our practices. A lot of our discussion and understanding about contemporary art practice has still very much relied on terminologies, references from the existing um, art history discourse. Um, so I think this is one of the urgent issues that we have to think about at this moment. I recently had a conversation with Boris Bryce in London in which he talked about a recent visit he had to Guangzhou 
and in Guangzhou in South China, he met with a lot of practitioners in China. And he was very confused, he was puzzled. He said, how come many of the Chinese artists and critics, all they talked to me about was Andy Warhol and Boris uh, Boyce as their references for their artistic practice. What about their own history? What about your own history? And he said that he actually he realized that there is a certain, um, what he called a suppressed socialist modernity that has existed in China, many places in Asia that have yet to be fully examined. And I think this is a very question to raise is how do we look at our own history? How do we um, develop methodologies and approaches to, to examine our own history? How do we come to terms with references and different inferences that have shaped our modernist history to begin with. I think this is still need to be addressed before we come to terms with um, who, who we are today. And one of the projects and one of the ideas that we have developed through this conversation is called Accidental Message. We begin to look at certain um, practices and models that that try to emulate the idea of a existing system and maybe try to emulate a certain kind of art history discourse in, in the West and in Europe and America, but actually has its own relevances to our specific context. So this is something that I'm trying to work with at the moment. Carol, I think you've come up with a great point that we need to really remember which is the, the real search for uh, localized ways of talking about what's currently going on in Asia, that um, the language or the kind of vocabulary is, and certainly in the writings in English and, and some writings in Chinese, have been very focused on Western theory. And so I know that there are some there are some in China who are trying to do this very important critical work. I think it also uh, tells us something about where China is at right now too, that the, 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 um, the forms of validation for artists are fairly limited to the marketplace right now. That in fact, if, if you talk to most artists, the way that they value their work would be in terms of their place within the market which is fairly uh, circumscribed, in fact, much more circumscribed in a place like China than here, where there are websites that determine your ranking in terms of your sales prices and things like that. So artists in China are very attuned to the marketplace, precisely because these other forms of validation, like uh, curatorial, uh, curatorial support, museum exhibitions, uh, art criticism in other forms of media simply don't exist in a robust way. So I think Carol and, Carol and your attempts to actually develop this new kind of vocabulary are, um, are really meaningful. Now if I could turn to a little bit of a discussion about curatorial practice, Betty Sivanapsara. You know, um, for either of you, where do you think we need to go in terms of developing curatorial Approaches to Asian contemporary art, given that certain models and, uh, and certain models have really reached their end point or have been certainly exhausted within even the, even here in the U.S. now after well on a decade for many of these sorts of museum exhibitions. What do you think is the is is a valid kind of new approach or new way of giving artists a voice within the museum context? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to some of the issues that were raised by Joan Carroll about um, local, local knowledge, um, met local methodologies. And um, I, I just want to point out that I think it might, it, it's helpful to look to other, other regions that are grappling with similar issues. Um, for example, the, there's a project that Mary, um, Carmen is Ramirez is doing at the uh, Houston um, Fine Arts Museum 
where she's digitizing important archives and documents from all over Latin America with a team of um, researchers, curators, and art historians who are going into archives and libraries in different major cities and then digitizing all that material and sending the digitized material back to Houston, um, which will eventually be an online um, digital archive and library that will be available to everyone. This is a way that you can keep your original material in its home country and yet circulate the information from these local nodes of knowledge. And it might be useful to think about that um, in the Asian context. Um, we have similar issues of language and translation as well. Um, as far as um, the direction of how to think about um, curating exhibitions of Asian art in the United States, um, it was very challenging for me to put this exhibition together when I went to India and spoke to the artists, many of the artists asked me the question, why are you doing another contemporary Indian show? We are so sick of them. We have seen so many. I have been in so many of these shows. Why are you doing this? And then I had to explain <laughs> that here in California, we had not seen the shows. We have not we do not know these artists very well, and that it was a place to start with this community to show an array of different perspectives, um, different artists, so that we can start on this journey of, of, of developing a deeper knowledge of individual practices, individual voices, and to start um, understanding those voices within other contexts. So I think that um, it's a difficult question of where, where do you start? How much does your community know about Asia, about um, different Asian art histories, different histories in different parts of the map? And um, how do you communicate um, a culture as an external curator, like Carol was talking about, as best you can with the kind of resources that we have in the museum sector here in the States. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways um, to address that, um, certainly within um, the kind of project that as far as working on, where this Vietnamese project is, is, is situated within a, a, a global context, um, so that the parallels are not within Asia, but across to um, cities um, in, in Latin America and in, I guess, Eastern Europe, and Lebanon. So um, I think that that's probably the way to go. I think that um, we need to sort of hop, skip, and jump across the globe and make new connections. Because as I said, I believe the artists are already making those connections and that they can really lead the way to how curators and museum professionals think about how connections can be made. I would, I would agree. Um, I think that increasingly we're living in um, a paradigm of um, hyper-connectivity, um, the building of platforms, the building of, of new networks. Um, and as you said, um, uh, a situation where the local is being subsumed into the, the global. And so um, I think collaboration becomes increasingly important. Um, and this gets to what Carol was saying before, in that you can't presume to speak for everyone, of course. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do in this um, larger group exhibition is to collaborate with curators who are living and working within each of these cities um, that are going to be involved in the exhibition so that, and they will each be writing essays um, on these artists and on the scenes um, within those cities um, so that there's, a, there's really a creation of a polyphony of voices um, present and so that there's not really one voice that's dominant. Um, and I think that's one thing that we can strive for. Um, 
Um, so I think um, collaboration and the acknowledgement of local voices um, becomes increasingly important. We have time for a few questions if people have them of our speakers. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand and standing. Yes, up the back there. Yes. Uh, 
what are the new categories that you're going to be if there are new? So some forward-looking hypotheticals. Betty Sue, you look like you're uh, infamous. <laughs> we are always trying to look to the future here, so let's see if I can tell you something. I, I, I think what we're seeing is more and more diffusion, right? That, that our notions of identity are shifting as we have more and more diffusion of different cultures sort of entering into other culture, and our whole notion of the specificity of culture is, is now sort of positioned within a much larger, much more expansive, dis, dispersed field. And as we start to even consider Asian, um, we consider Asia as a geographic place, we consider it as a culture, and as an idea, and even as a concept, right? And as we kind of move out from the literal, from we, we can still hold on to something that's specific. And I think that, you know, as you were talking about Alan, this is a show of stairs compared to this one, um, <clears throat> how specific, culturally specific do you need to be to be read as culturally specific? What, what, how much of India has to be in work for, for you to say, oh, India? And I think that that's going to shift dramatically. And a lot of things might get lost in the shuffle as that diffusion becomes, sort of weakens the centrality of, of, of a term. And, and therefore, the new terms will emerge. So anyway, that's my prediction. Good. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for this evening's first panel. Um, our next panel will join us right here up on the stage. Please welcome them and thank our panelists.